Creosote in the, uh, the lift of the creosote. <laughs> um, so yeah, there's a lot of stuff going on there. But I'm happy to answer questions or um, you know whatever, or comments or or anything. You live in Arizona still. I do. Um, I like the film a lot, and I want to ask something that I don't mean to sound disrespectful, but um, it's fine. <clears throat> there was an interesting correlation between, in essence, uh, the capitalization of the desert by, you know, white people that think they're going to change nothing into something, mm -hmm. and the capitalization of the desert in your father's mind. The depression where he's losing his mind. Right, right, right. Yeah. And um, coupled with that, um, you, you seem to keep the entire film sort of honed into that. Um, I guess it would be another film if you started interviewing people that were people that actually lived there beforehand, before all these newcomers right. came in. Yeah. Um, my parents live in Arizona as well. Um, and a few times I've visited them, I've seen a, an area that they're in completely becoming uh, burgeoning development. Now. Sure. Um, with no regards in a lot of ways to what's previously there, you start off in the beginning of the film talking about your enthusement with the land as a child, and I assume that's because of, uh, because you, as a child, I don't think most kids are thinking about capitalization at all. Sure, sure. Um, I, and, but then again, when you said you started to hate it, I'm assuming it's because of those reasons. But I, mean, I guess the question I'm asking is like, you know, so it's a slow drop. It's yeah. a long film. <laughs> no, it's fine. It. Equally, that's it's a lot completely of stuff fair. Um, is this some, uh, some up of how you feel about the state of Arizona today? Or, uh, I mean. Um. Well, I, I mean, I, I think that the film, I mean, initially started out trying to, you know, posit like Del Webb as this real um, villain character. Um, and it, it's very easy to try to see these things, you know, as opposition. But, you know, I think one of the most compelling characters in the film for me is the, um, is the police, the sheriff's, you know, the captain of the sheriff's posse. The posse yeah. And, you know, and when I interviewed people in Sun City, I didn't put all the other interviews in there. But a lot of people, you know, really, really did um, add years to their life, you know, and and they had a supportive community. Actually, ironically, Sun City doesn't have fences or gates set up, like he designed it without that. So people's backyards connect with one another. And so it was the sort of people who came after him who, who created a, um, a more sort of rigid, you know, prison-like um, architecture. Um, so, you know, it, it's seeing seeing the complexities of the issues. It may be have, may it may have this uh, function that was beyond Del Webb's ability to capitalize on it. Like he set it up, and people think of him as being like the sort of patron saint. But it's still people connecting with one another and inner acting on a human level that allows for meaning in their lives, you know, beyond the sort of tyranny of certain aspects of the architecture or the tyranny of the development that is imposed on that landscape. And I think it's just, I just thought it was incredibly ironic that, I mean, one of the things about the creosote, that this bush that's for hundreds of years or thousands of years perhaps, you know, actually nourished people in old age by getting rid of arthritis and, you know, these other things, and they were in tune with it. 
I mean, that's the one, I think, engagement for me is through Michael Moore to talk about the, um, the, uh, the plants and those properties being engaged with a, a more indigenous population um, and how that's the first thing that they actually bulldoze. And they tend to save the saguaro cactuses and then they all put, line them all up, you know, because those are endangered. But the creosote, you know, is this amazing thing. And, and you know, ironically, like we're going to, or maybe it's not ironic, but we're going to, you know, make it uninhabitable for people with global warming, but the creosote will probably just keep going and, you know, take over the malls and everything. So, you know, it'll ultimately win. So there's, I wasn't trying to simplify things, and that's why I think that there is a discursive structure to the film, um, because it's not so simple, you know, no, at least not. for that. It's, it's, it's a beautiful film. The, the second question has nothing to do with the first thing is, you must just spend hours and hours and hours and hours and hours and hours and hours researching, like trying to dig up all this film footage and stuff. Um, yeah, I mean, some of it's available, um, you know, online, and it's it's interesting. There's a certain funny thing we actually, my wife and I, helped Rick, Rick Prellinger, and if you don't know the archive.org um, website, um, we actually helped him in San Francisco. We used to live there, and we helped like clear out like three or four labs because he was really concerned first that California was going to break off and like sink into the ocean and, and he didn't really talk about the people dying he wanted to save all the, the original printing materials and so he sent all that stuff to his warehouse in New York um, so probably some of the films and then, then he sold it to the Library of Congress and then he digit you know stuff is digitized so it could be some of the films that I like lugged into a semi truck in California, I end up, ended up downloading for this project later on. Um, but you know, it's it's like any it's like any project, and this is really like there's a certain memoir component to it. So it takes it took a lot of you know digging and a lot of process, and so I couldn't see the end. Honestly, I didn't see the end of the film until very near the end. Like I didn't realize this <coughs> Lou Douglas character actually, who was actually from Bisbee, where I'm now living actually had this connection to both Wilhelm Reich and um, Del Webb. And, I, and I, for me, it didn't really matter. Like, I could sort of create this fictional connection to them because they were both there and they represented these different relationships with the environment. But then there really was this figure who actually, like, and ironically, it was through a bank. It was through money exchanging hands between helping Reich, you know, find this, this ranch place to do his research and then also helping Del Webb to... Um, by these Las Vegas properties. So, I mean, I think it's, it's interesting with the, um, you know, all this Occupy activity going on and, and for me to see, you know, the real fallout of that on this physical level and be dealing with it for quite a few years beforehand, it's really exciting that it's like taking a different form, you know, that's not just this mourning that I sort of felt for a long time. So, yes? I had two questions. One, how long did it take to do the film? It was like f like four year, four plus years from like the initial part of it to to I finished it. I think uh, February of not no uh, like early early uh, of ten of ten. So. The other question that I had, I mean, it's not so much a question, but I was really intrigued how the appearance of certain people uh, in the in the film, um, like Annie's and uh -huh. um, I forget the herbalist's name now. Michael Moore. Yeah, Michael yeah. Moore, yeah. Um, it was interesting to me that you made this choice to sort of have this sort of footnote about their, uh, well, with Michael, his passing, right. and also with Annie's, her um, sort of being forced to leave the country. It, it kind of had, for me, the effect of like sort of a they're exiting the stage of this narrative to a certain oh, degree. Huh. And I'm wondering like why you made the choice to why you made that choice. As opposed to doing that with every other figure. Yeah, because there were other people that were sort of telling parts of the story. Uh because I mean I didn't want to just say that, you know, I don't, it just didn't seem as significant to say, you know, Jim is no longer the head of the posse. Um, I guess it because it represented certain like you know like significant like political or um, 
you know, existential relationships between their voice and what's functioning in the film. Um, I guess you know, that was one of the choices. And there's a lot of like sort of you know loose ends in this thing. So like formally, it's not one thing. And um, you know, so you know, if it was on PBS, they probably would say yes, we need it on each one, or else people would get confused or or whatever. But you know, we can do whatever we want, and <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> which is which is cool. Um, yeah, I wasn't disturbed by it. I no, it's an interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it was more like the the implications of that of leaving the stage. You know, like in terms of Anais, the uh, the alien, the whole alien um, thread that goes through, and that you know the 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 Del Webb building, the concentration camps, and like you know the Japanese aliens and the space aliens. That that was you know part of that, and then death. You know where Ike talks about like the inevitability, and that's why we get all sharp is because we're trying to like stave off the death. So, mm -hmm. yeah. yes. Yeah, I, um, without knowing really what you're intending by calling it an essay, I, it it makes a lot of sense to me watching the film um, as a as a way to describe it. Yeah. And I I was well. I mean, I'd be very happy to hear. If you, if you feel like elaborating on, on why you choose to describe it that way. But more than that, I was just curious if you would share with us a little bit how that corresponds with uh, the ways that the film is disseminated. If I think of like an es a text essay, mm -hmm. it usually corresponds with certain kinds of publications. Mm -hmm. um, do you think of that also applying to, to this essay? Uh, is this the typical type of venue where you hope and try and and do show it, or um, is it shown online? Are there other ways yeah. that it feels most appropriately? Different? I mean, I love this. I mean, I love this context. Honestly, uh, my wife Rebecca and I—we actually started like we invented the the term micro cinema. We came up with this this term in '93 or whatever for our total mobile home space in San Francisco. So I have a whole history of like curating and like artist spaces and like the intimacy that happens within that. So, I mean this, you know, some people be like, oh, well, you know, only 30 people are at the show, you know, you know, whatever. But for me, it's like far more rewarding than, you know, than having it run a week at the Angelica or something in New York and, you know, you just don't, there's a real beauty to this organization and the people who come here and that network around the country and around the world or whatever. Um, so that's that's fine with me. I, I think the online thing is it takes a certain. Uh, I have a feeling it might go online at some point, but it tends. To, I would imagine people wouldn't have the attention span to sit through it. And there's something not really nice about being in a community with people sitting and like you sort of feel the energy of people trying to processing it together, um, which is maybe a real Reichian thing. You know, we're sharing the orgone and all that. <laughs> Um, but in terms of essay, the, like the, the root of essay is actually like to try or to tempt, uh, attempt, like um, in the French essay, I think, or I'm sure somebody knows French better than I, but you know, so that it's not about like, it's not about justifying a thesis like in a Hamlet essay for, you know, high school. It's about like really examining things and like processing and trying to understand them. So. I like to think of it in that original context um, rather than in the, the more literary. Yeah, and, you know, I mean, like, you know, and may, you know, whatever, you know, great essays that, you know, like that you may read in the New Yorker or something are often pretty open ended at times. Um, but I think the challenge is, is like, you know, dissemination. There's so many documentary film festivals, and there's a, often a fairly rigid sense about what constitutes documentary. And then, you know, whether this fits in or not, it's easier for me to call it something else that's not that, even though, you know, 90% of this or 95% of it is, is true, you know? Um, the only section that's pretty, is made up is that Reichian critique, Reichian critique of um, Sun City that happens towards the beginning where this guy, this German man sort of t tells this monologue and that that was just a, a um, sort of connecting piece that you know is not nobody 
wrote except for me, you know, and the rest of it's based on, you know, on real hard research or whatever, or interviews. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I was curious, because uh, you did the little short film on the Pan and I was curious where your work's going from here. You're still doing more with Arizona or... You know, that, that pretty much, um, I want to move to Portland, Oregon now, honestly. <laughs> um, the, the, you know, it, it worked out, it worked out a certain um, desire to like come to terms with things and the real challenge with Arizona is unlike Buffalo, it doesn't have a history of media arts and it's after living there for seven years, it's, it's really, um, I need that nourishment and I need that community and um, it's, uh, you know, and people say, you know, they come for the weather and but there's only so much sun you can take in any, and not to, not to be callous around you folks, because you probably, <laughs> you probably uh, have quite a few cloudy days, but um, I, I don't honestly know, probably not in the same uh, length anymore, but um, you know, film festivals, they do like you know, 15 to 30 minute films, and I wouldn't mind you know, the next thing. I just did that Buffalo thing, um, you know, a couple months ago, so it's, I'm not quite sure where the next, the next thing is, but, um, I don't know, used to, I don't know. But this film actually was made up of a lot of smaller films that are all sutured together, so it's not complete, it's not like a, um, you know, a scripted narrative, you know, for me it is related to the ex short experimental films I've made for 20 years, it's just, you know, a extended meditation, um, Using different, you know, on one theme, with different, different formal strategies. But uh, yeah, I bet. I mean, the interesting thing is, I bet probably a lot of you, even if you haven't been to the desert, probably have relatives who live down there, and how that's changed in the last 20 years, where a lot of people, you know, have a connection to it that they may not have had before. So. You know, I hope that, that it can be somewhat, um, this film can be somewhat, you know, educational in the documentary sense about people who see it just being aware of, of the, of the um, some of the dynamics in play, you know, the political and ecological um, dynamics of play, because um, it's a huge, a huge marketing thing. And, you know, this whole, the aging of the baby boomers, and I'm sure it's just going to increase as well. Nobody's asked me about Reich. It's so funny. Usually that's the way. Is there a Reich question over there? No, but uh, there's a number of different sort of social strata that you that enter into the film and they sort of pass unaddressed in a way, like, well, family, you know, and then, but then there's this whole stratum of uh, crazy people, maybe even including your father and. Right. Uh, issues of madness and so forth, maybe, you know. Then there's another I issue of. Um, uh, of um, uh, rich people, you know, or greedy people, right. like these land developers and all that. Yeah, know. yeah. It's a thematic thing. Yes. Yeah. through. And then there's also queer, uh, sort of intimation of queer people, like, I mean, like, I don't know, that's something that how jumped out at me with, uh, um, uh, uh, with uh, Hoover and uh, Buddy Hackett. Oh, oh you right. know, like, what's Bob Buddy Hackett yeah. doing in this film? Yeah. And I'm thinking, like, what kind of connection is that? <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm wondering uh, if if you had thought about you know like some way of 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 um, of how these things are sort of connected or not connected to each other because they uh, I mean they're the, weird yeah the relationship between the, you know like the land grabbing and the uh, and the sexual differentiation or I mean just all all the permutations are weird. Yeah, I mean, I, but I think that that there's, I wanted exceptionally odd people in the film all the way through. <laughs> well, except, yeah, but, except your son, you know, but the family, you know, thing is. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I think there's a, I think there's a. Um, the generational thing, though, too. I mean, it makes me think that I would. I'm suddenly imagining Buffalo as, as a good site for a uh, retirement community. <laughs> 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 
Um, I mean, it's interesting because um, I mean the family, the family, the family thing. I mean, it, it does, it does. I mean, I do feel I addressed it because you know the parallels between my family and the generations and and you know the people retiring and leaving their home that that um, you know their kids have moved on and there's empty nesters. So I think there's there's this um, component in my practice of things like rubbing together that. I just allow to rub together that generate a kind of energy without saying it's because of this or I think this about it. Mm -hmm. um, and it may be unsettling or disconcerting, um, but I like where that energy can exist. Um, the queerness, you know, it's actually, you said that, that said that because there's, I mean, that's sort of a cliche about um, a J. Edgar Hoover. Um, and the the the, um, the Buddy Hackett thing honestly is become more of a litmus lit, litmus test of like the liveliness of an audience or the age of an audience because I've shown it to like younger like a younger you know like classes and stuff and nobody knows who Buddy Hackett is <laughs> and it was one of those things of like there's a book that the Dell Web Corporation made that was a coffee table like vanity book that was this history of him. And you know, it's him with him with Richard Nixon, him with Lyndon Johnson, him with um, Howard Hughes, and then him with Buddy Hackett. <laughs> and I was just like, you know, there's got to be this sort of like, you know, there's this punchline somewhere, and I don't know. So it was one of those moments, and you know, with the piece that's so long, there's certain things like inside jokes that sometimes artists put in, and then sometimes other people get, and sometimes they don't just to keep yourself amused in those hours of like, you know, going through footage. Um, but I don't, I don't, I don't um, have a problem with things not being fully resolved, because honestly there's limits to my ability to try to explain things like that, 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 are, that just keep going on, you know, and it had to sort of end it at some point. But, uh, yeah, thank you. Um, in relation yeah. to that question, what really resonated with me was um, when in the interview with your father when he mentioned the map of his brain. Oh right, right. And and here you know this film is is showing like um, wait who the the cognitive map of um, right and and you know the map of Sun City. So right. I just wondered how you fully realized how you know, like. Did you fully realize a connection between the, I mean, you mentioned psychogeography. Right, right. The connection between the map of your father's brain and the map of the landscape, and how did you come to um, that connection? I mean, yeah, yeah, I mean, that was, uh, it was, it was, that came later, and that was like a, the final interview I did. So I had been dealing with these issues of maps, and then he said that, you know, and the, the strange thing about this is he's seen this film a couple times and he can't remember being interviewed because of the, um, you know, the um, electroconvulsive therapy. So he's like, thank you for saving this like part of my life that I completely forgot about, you know? So it, as a, some people say like, oh, did you feel like you were violating, you know, his space and, and all of that, um, you know, it's this, document now and he's feeling better and I don't know if that was a result of that or, or not but um, you know like when things affect your family in a really intense way and it's not just like the moment but it's often like you know built up issues over many years between generations or you know fathers and sons or mothers and daughters that um, that being able to work with the material and, and see it for something greater than just that you know, dynamic, or more, like, greater, but also more personal, like, more human, you know. Um, it was, it was really special, and then to, and, and also becoming aware of it through having a, a child myself, somehow you cut your parents, like, a little more slack once you're a parent yourself. <laughs> so, and it's interesting, because Peter Reich thought he was going to be a movie star, because if you've seen the Dushan Makabea film, the, um, W.R. Mystery of the Organism. Mm -hmm. They all came and uh, and did all these interviews, and he thought he was going to be like that. That was going to be this path he took, and 
and I'm not sure what happened to him. Like he may have become a scientist or something. But there's this, this book of dreams is really amazing. It's really hard to find, but I found it at the Tombstone Public Library right near where I live. Like remarkably, and you know, it's like worth like you know sixty dollars on you know AV books. But you know, it was sort of this gift. Like, oh, I can get it at the library. This whole memoir, because Reich is really hard to read, and he's pretty impenetrable in many ways. So like the memoir of his son is like this very different inroad into into that life. Yeah. In one part, you mentioned, I think a moment ago, that the German-speaking person? Yeah. That was something that you made up? Was yes. That what you said? Yes. From a structural standpoint, I guess you can put anything you want in your film. Uh, but now that you've acknowledged that, I'm reflecting on the fact that I found it um, somewhat disturbing because you've got a mixture of so many styles. You've mm -hmm. got a documentary style, um, and I've read almost all of the right. Okay. So, so you yeah. did a great job, I think, of presenting the story without necessarily distorting it. And you've got interviews with people, interspersed real people, giving their point of view. Uh, you've got your own point of view. So there's a lot of personal stuff. There's a lot of documentary stuff. There's a lot of educational material all mixed in. But the, the one piece that stuck out was that German piece. Right. And the impression it gives is that because it's get delivered with a German accent, it's easy to mistake that as being right reading. Right. And it's easy to mistake that as Reich forming for you a correlation between what he perceived as the organ accumulator right. effect and the round, the round uh, architecture and the format, right. the architectural format of the land and the environment, along with the boxes. And you ended up drawing a conclusion which you now admit is something fictitious right. yet powerful in which it you know, kind of connotes the fact that you're giving approval to this connection. So it seems somewhat fraudulent and I'm wondering how you can justify that I can. in the context of all the other mixed yeah. material you have. I can. Does that comment seem valid though? Without being offensive? Um. Yeah, I mean, for, for somebody who's a Reikian scholar, you know, such as yourself, I can I can understand that being unsettling. Um, I think for me, the the balance is that you end up having the real Reich voice later on in that in that audio clip. Um, so, which may you know, being it's a time-based medium, how your memory of the experience whether or not you can correlate like, oh, well that was, was that the other one not the real Reich if this is the real Reich, you know, and about that, you know, that there is a difference. I'm not trying to hide that difference. Um, but, I mean, it's, a, it's an avenue for me of investigation that, I mean, I didn't, I didn't say this is Wilhelm Reich speaking. There's, a, there's an intimation of that. But, you know, if you feel that, you know, it, um, if it creates a, a blockage for you in terms of the reception of the film, I mean, I can understand that. And I'm not really trying to, like, pull the wool over anyone's eyes. It was a, it was, it was like a, a poetic engagement of, like, wow, what if Reich actually did comment on on Sun City and what might he have said. And instead of like putting quotes around it, I I just put it in the piece itself. Well but that's the problem. There's no attribution. Everybody right. else was attributed. They were identified, you had a subtitle or you told us who they were. Right. But only the benefit of you being here do I get to know the truth. Right. That's odd to me that you, I mean, because I thought it was fake when I heard it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, not to, no, I'm, I'm not sure. Yeah, no, but people have no, said that. Yeah, I was like, yeah, that's like someone 
basically composing something for this piece, and I didn't, I didn't really view it in terms of fraudulence or not, because I didn't, I mean, regardless of the historical <coughs> veracity of any of this, right, right. I don't accept it as like a document of anything, it's to me, personally, right. you know what I mean, it almost seems like, I mean, not to be reductive, but it seems like an extension of like American mythos in a way, you know, like it's, it's a story. You know? Well, yeah. I found it fascinating, and, and I allowed yeah. the possibility that it might be true. I, I couldn't, you know, I couldn't recall where Wright might have said that. You know, yeah. it had me thinking: Do I have to go back and reread all of it? <laughs> you know, I, mean, yeah. I, don't, I don't mind that you yeah. make a speculation on that, yeah. but I just think it's a bit more honest if you acknowledge that. You know, I, I mean, I like I like the component of of play in art and and sometimes play can come across as something other than it is and for me I can I can allow that in my own reception of artwork and I can allow it into certain components of my making practice like it's a it's a structure I mean I'm creating something you know and I'm referencing but I'm referencing the real world and some things I feel are really solid, but you know, Michael Moore could be spitting certain, you know, certain uh, fabrications around. I mean, I deeply respect him, but you know, even as a scholar, there's there's a way that that could possibly be. So I think for me, it's the sum and the the sort of someone mentioned about the maps, the sort of cognitive experience we go through as an audience person watching this and experiencing different states, different loose ends, different characters, without really trying to um, prioritize or say that this is absolute for anyone. I mean, my father doesn't even remember doing this. I mean, that's so weird that that, you know, that could be this, that's the only thing he could, uh, the only evidence that he went through this, like, mind-erasing um, electroshock therapy. So it goes both ways, I think. But I really appreciate you br bringing that up because nobody said that before, and I have mentioned it in the past. But I pr maybe nobody else has been as attuned with Reich to say, like, you know, to take it personally. And I can understand that, you know. And that's that's um, great that you came and you know can call me on it. She's trying to. Oh, I'm sorry. Hi. No, I was just, I, I guess I was going to make a comment to that gentleman's comment, which would be that, um, and maybe another woman who spoke as well, like, when I hear the word essay, I think of a subjective document, uh -huh. an overtly um, subjective document that's owning itself as such. Um, and I think that an essay is just, it's not necessarily a, a, a literary composition, but it is necessarily subjective, so that's kind of, in every definition, I guess, of the word essay, something that's kind of ingrained. Um, but similarly, when I have like an intent interest in a subject, I take things um, very personally right. as well. So I certainly, I understand that as well. But I, I kind of wrote off the things that I didn't necessarily um, feel completely in agreement with as, Part of the, a function of the of the structure. Right, right, right. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's the real beauty of the you know this uh, this medium is that you can construct these these elaborate things and um, and how they touch different people in different ways. You know, depending upon your experience base, and then how you can acknowledge your own process of making and and all that and sharing it. And that's why I'm glad it's not on the internet because I guess someone could do the say some like spamming thing like you know how dare you <laughs> you know they could do that but it's nice to you know to hear those comments in person you know where, where people are engaged and you can have a dialogue around it because ultimately um, I mean that's one of the things that's so difficult about these modern you know western towns and so much of modern culture is how just how separated people are and, and just to be able to share work one-on-one uh, -on -one or with a small group is really meaningful. And um, so that's why I applaud Squeaky Wheel for being around for so long. And uh, it's great to finally be here. So um, thanks so much for coming. And um, keep up the good work here, Buffalo.
Okay. Feel free to stick around. Um, Dave will be around too if anybody has any And you've got questions. a great show coming up next week, right? Yes, I was just going to mention that. Yeah, go Ellen Jax. Hill, and um, it's called the Flor Floristine Collection. And it's um, by a filmmaker called Helen Hill, who was an experimental animator. She lived in New Orleans. And she actually um, was shot to death after Hurricane Katrina. Um, she had returned there with her husband, and then and during the middle of the night, this had happened, an intruder came into her home and um, it killed her. And um, she was actually in the middle of making this film called The Floristine Collection, which was, you know, um, she had come across like 27 or 100 dresses actually in a trash bin. And she was really intrigued by these beautiful handmade dresses. And so she was collecting them. Then she was trying to find out who made these dresses. And actually, there was this seamstress who lived in New Orleans. And she had also passed away. And so while she's doing all this investigation, she actually passes away herself. And um, her husband, who had never done any filmmaker in his whole entire life, finishes the film for her um, with some of her friends. And it's a really beautiful um, film. It's it's half of what she had set out to intent uh, to do, but also half of the memoir. And then um, that night we have a Buffalo musician, Damian Weber, um, performing. And he's going to perform to some of his films that he had worked on that are, um, they are, uh, um, sorry, I'm getting a little bit sick. <laughs> They're montages of uh, Polish cartoon footage. Yeah, have you seen it? Yeah. Yeah, it's really fun. So he like made all these folk songs around the, these films that he arranged. So he's gonna be here with the full band. And that's on the eighteenth, so it's gonna be a really beautiful night and sad. It's gonna be a sad evening. But, <laughs> but very beautiful. So we hope to see you there. Tell us the film, actually? I, I do, I do have, I do have some copies that I sell, yeah. How much, uh, I would like to...